Thank you for all for joining us. We're going to wait a couple of minutes um, so we get the attendees in. Uh, so we'll start in a couple of minutes. So we'll get started. We know people will be trickling in the whole time. So um, <clears throat> I just want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar around global experiential learning. This is kind of just an introduction um, to what we'll be doing this semester. A uh, little bit about what JEL is, what we have, uh, <clears throat> what we have done in the past, and hopefully can continue after this pandemic is over. Um, what you can gain as a student, and then or our participant, uh, faculty or staff member as well. Um, what, how we're changing and evolving for this fall during the pandemic, um, our different phases that we're gonna roll out, and then how you can be a part of it um, in general, um, in different ways. So my name is Dan Sayapan. I've been the director for uh, GEL, Global Experiential Learning, for the past uh, three years. I've been on campus for the past 16 years and was the past uh, director of the Asian Pacific American Student Affairs where this all started. Um, and really uh, finding the need for global experiential learning for uh, students, especially um, traditionally marginalized students, students of color, first generation students, uh, low income students, and providing these inclusive and diverse opportunities for them um, and providing more access to that. Um, that isn't only for those students, but for all students uh, at the University of Arizona. So I have a wonderful team that just joined me a couple of weeks ago. I want them to introduce themselves and they'll be sharing part of the experience with you all. I'll go first. Um, hi everyone, I'm Yemi. I am a graduate assistant for GEL. Um, I am a first year mas a master's graduate student at the School of um, Geography, Development and Environment. And uh, why gel is just simply because I, why I'm working for gel, simply because I love the product. Well, I believe in its product and its mission, and I am a product of uh, a gel program. So yeah, that's it. I'll go ahead and go next. So my name is Elena Puff. I'm the other graduate assistant for gel. I am a fourth year PhD student in the school psychology program. And what attracted me to GEL is because my own um, opportunity to travel abroad influenced my decision to go into public education. So I understand the value and the importance of these experiences. Uh, 
I'll go next. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Cristal. Uh, pronouns are she, her, hers, and ella. Um, my major, or well, what I'm studying is, I'm a doctoral student in educational leadership and policy program here at the U of A. Um, I am first gen and I kind of fall in kind of the same as Yemi um, with the identities of gel. And I think it's super awesome that we have a program like this because I didn't really have the opportunity to travel as much. So I want to kind of give back to the community as well. Hi everyone, my name is Giselle Delsid. I'm a first year doctoral student in the College of Education as well. Um, I have been with JALNL for four years. Um, I'm interested in JAL solely for the fact that all of my identities align with this program. Who I am um, is clearly represented within this program and the goals that we achieve have allowed me to travel, not just domestically, but as well as internationally. So I really love JAL. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana Castillo. I'm a senior in my undergrad year studying criminal justice with a minor in psychology. This is my second year with working with JAL. And like everyone else has mentioned, I love working for JAL just because um, as being a low income student, it's great to travel and growing up, you don't think you have these opportunities to, but JAL definitely breaks those barriers and makes you realize that you can find yourself while traveling and meet new people and try new things. And it's definitely a great experience to learn what you like and meet new people. Okay, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa, I am an intern for JAL. I'm a senior here at the U of A. Um, my majors are political science and public management and policy. Um, I knew about JAL since my sophomore year and my junior year too. Um, and I decided to work for them during the summer. And it was awesome. It was, I learned quite a lot. And they offered me a position here in the fall. So I definitely hopped on that. And yeah, it's a really good program that incorporates a lot of what you need to know like as a minority and someone who, and who aspires to like travel a lot. So it's a really good program to get to know. Hello, my name is Leslie Soto. I am a current senior at the U of A. I am studying spe speech pathology and I have a main minor in Spanish. Um, I, the reason why I found out about JAL was uh, because I had the opportunity to become an intern during the summer and I was really fascinated by this program just by the sole fact that it's very inclusive with diversity and uh, many like minorities and I just thought that it's very different like from study abroad and I was very interested in it. Thank you all. Um, so a little bit about our mission, JAL integrates travel, multicultural e education, service learning, um, and to empower students with knowledge, skills, and values as they continue their careers at the U of A and abroad or anywhere else. Um, so JAL is committed to increasing access and participation for historically marginalized students. So this includes uh, students of color, first generation students, uh, DACA and undocumented students, so income, low SES students, low income students, um, et cetera, uh, at programs at the U of A. Um, and what we do is we strive to create more intentional, inclusive, um, and multicultural competent programs to provide a, a positive um, experience for students at the U of A. So what is JAL? A little bit about JAL um, is that we're actually partnered with the Office of Multicultural Advancement, and that's where students develop knowledge, skills, values, um, and experiences both domestically and internationally, um, which is pretty cool that we also have um, an aspect that we focus on domestic trips or programs. Um, so kind of adding on to that, we're identity focused. So with this, a lot of students uh, tend to find or develop um, their identity when we travel abroad or domestically, um, as sometimes they're able to kind of connect with different values or cultures. Um, a little bit about active learning and service learning is that we do community work, um, community service, and we kind of learn as we go. It's not a traditional um, like classroom setting, which is pretty cool. And then social and environmental injustice are things that we focus on when we travel um, and kind of having that aspect is really important to us. And having a cultural exploration is seeing the different perspectives and values of cultures as we do um, travel to different locations. And then developing a multicultural competence, once again, is working with different cultures um, 
and kind of seeing like their values and how it might be different from here in the U.S. Yeah, so regarding some of the institutional barriers that we do see within typical study abroad, um, we do see that finances have a huge play within this. Uh, we see that these students who often are not, you know, thinking about studying abroad or can't study abroad is because they are um, unable to access funding. They're not able to, you know, pay for these $10,000 trips all around the world. Um, and so we provide trips that are ultimately low cost and efficient for these students. We also take into account time frame. A lot of these students can't go into studying abroad because they often face the inability to go uh, during this um, semester long trip. So ultimately these students, you know, are caregivers within their families. Students are often, you know, the ones that have to, you know, help their parents pay the bills and. So if they were to leave, you know, for a, an extended amount of time, it would ultimately leave them um, and able to help their family back here at home. So what we do is we, we make sure that we provide students with the ability to have short, um, meaningful trips during, some, uh, during summer, during spring break, as well as winter. Um, we also have orientations with students. So what we often see with study abroad as well is that they often go and they, you know, kind of go into these countries with no knowledge on the culture, no knowledge on what is going on there, um, you know, the social matters. So we provide students with, um, you know, kind of a three day or a three part series of an orientation that we try to give these students some type of background on what's going on within these countries and uh, respectfully, um, not from a touristy point of view, but as well as, uh, you know, a meaningful idea of what's going on. We also have family influences. Um, as first generation students, a lot of times families don't understand what these students are going through. They also don't understand why students might want to study abroad. They might see it as kind of a waste of time. They might see it as, oh, well, you know, you don't need to go do that. Um, but we understand that these are things that can happen and they don't really see the value of what traveling can provide you as students. We also see the LGBTQ plus barriers, <clears throat> excuse me, have, um, you know, a lot of trauma might arise from that, you know, and that's not something that's discussed with these students because a lot of times students might go to countries where these uh, identities are not recognized, they're not valued, they're not seen um, with respect. So a lot of students will end up having to kind of go back into the closet when they go to these countries. So ultimately what happens is that we provide that we provide knowledge and we provide kind of like a heads up to these students, hey, like this is what's going to happen and we provide support as well as um, just guidance through this. We also provide students with academic and career path um, knowledge. So we want to make sure that with these activities that we're doing, making sure that what we're doing uh, within these countries and within these places, that we provide these students with something that they're able to see as valuable and able to translate, translate that onto their resumes. Um, these are all uh, programs that are open to all majors um, and they're able to apply what they learn back here at home. Um, also, we have lack of representation. A lot of students um, don't go into study abroad, right, because they don't see people uh, who look like them on these pamphlets. They don't see students who are, you know, coming from the same backgrounds, the same values, the same identities. So ultimately, you know, they feel like they can't be seen or recognized within, within these programs. And also leadership also might uh, take a play with that because they can't necessarily go to someone who isn't coming from these same uh, backgrounds as them. So now that you have an understanding of kind of our mission and core values as an organization, as well as some of the institutional barriers that impede students' ability from partaking in these global experiences, on this slide, I'm going to share with you on how we are unique as an organization. So I'll begin with the structure of GEL. We really function in a tiered structure program, which includes our local and domestic programming that are usually trips centered around one to three days. And the nice thing about these trips, as Giselle mentioned, you know, time is definitely a considerable factor. If you don't have the opportunity to take a whole semester to study abroad, these one to three day trips are a great opportunity that kind of cater around a student's schedule. The other really enticing thing about these trips is that they're virtually free or very low cost to students. So again, understanding the costs associated with large scale travel, this is something that would be a great opportunity and kind of distinguishes us from other programs. 
We also have our international trips, which again, given the nature of international travel are longer in duration and are really centered around cultural immersion. Um, so again, just offering these different options to students is something that makes us um, unique. In terms of recruitment, we kind of went over that we're targeting individual students who may not have opportunities to do this. So low income students, stu stu students of color, um, doc DACA and undocumented students. We really want to give uh, these marginalized students group groups an opportunity to partake in this kind of global experiential learning. Um, another thing, I talked about accessibility and affordability of these programmings. Another component of this travel is that we're really centering these trips around issues of social justice, environmental justice, developing your cultural identity and understanding how that's different across these uh, different travel sites. Um, as well as service learning. So we're not going on these trips solely to be tourists and partake in this, in this experience, but really immersing ourselves in these different cultures and addressing societal topics that we really need to be discussing um, across these different trips. The other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention about these trips is that we recruit uh, diverse faculty and staff from the University of Arizona to come with us on these trips. So again, to help kind of facilitate this experience for students, we're bringing in professors and other individuals across the university to kind of serve as a liaison on these trips between Tucson, University of Arizona, and then wherever we're traveling. Another program um, that we offer if you partake in these trips is the domestic wildcat program meeting the international wildcat program. So what this means is we have micro campuses all across the world that aren't considered necessarily your typical branch campus, um, but there are these UA campuses that are connected to other successful campuses worldwide. So really a cool experience for students is to connect with other individual students at these micro campuses who are taking the same classes, having very similar experiences to you here at the main university, um, but being able to connect. And I think the really cool part about this is that it kind of blurs the line of who's the domestic student and who's the international student because these, these conversations are taking place elsewhere other than Tucson. Um, another collaboration that we really strive is we partner with other domestic higher ed institutions here back at home um, to work and collaborate with other different students across the country on issues of global experiential learning. So um, this is something that we get different perspectives, even, you know, from a domestic standpoint. Another factor that I would really encourage you to consider when thinking about partaking in gel is the career development. So not only do you get this travel experience, you get this opportunity to immerse yourself in a, in a different culture and, and learn a ton of things, but you also are able to develop a set of skills that can be directly translated into the workforce. So not only is this experience beneficial for the short term, but also the long term. Um, another thing that is really unique is that we offer a gel symposium every April on, here, back here on campus. And this is a great opportunity to learn more um, from students who have partaken in this experience. So during the gel symposium, students share posters and presentations about what they learned on, during their time, during their travel with the UA community. Um, so this is a good opportunity to network with students who partaken in gel experiences, but also um, really get to see the tangible things that they learn from these trips. Um, and then the final thing I'll leave you with is we recently received the uh, Research and Innovation Award. And so um, I think this award is really showcasing our commitment to this work. Um, so the fact that we're one of the few groups across the country that is really centering our efforts around getting marginalized students on accessibility to, in, to travel experiences. So again, that's something that makes us really unique and by offering financial assistance in any way we can, taking into consideration time components, I really think it distinguishes us from other programs. Hi everyone, so here is a breakdown of our past JAL programs. I like to mention that we always have something in the works, um, whether it's our domestic winter, spring break, and our summer programs, um, there's always something for students to participate in. So for our domestic um, programs, they're usually a one day or they can be a weekend long program, such as our Apache um, Nation program, where we head up a little bit north of Arizona to interact with Native American tribes. And um, usually um, our transportation is included in these domestic trips, which is a plus because whether you're from Tucson or you're international out-of-state student, um, students not 
um, usually have like transportation to get to these programs. So it's great that we make transportation accessible and that it's not a barrier for students to not participate in our programs. Um, and the cost could be free or we ask that students put down a 20 to 25 refundable fee, but of course they get it back the day of the program. Um, and as for our winter program, I had the opportunity to go to our Southeast Asia program where we traveled to four countries in a span of 18 days. We visited Vietnam and got to learn about the Vietnam War and the U.S. impact over there because, you know, growing up in the U.S., um, you hear a lot of um, a different perspective, definitely, where you hear how we are the heroes, but going and traveling abroad, you hear how it has impacted foreign countries and still to this day. Um, as well, we traveled to Laos where we learned about um, the impact of the U.S. war over there, how there are still bombs still to this day, and you hear a lot about um, the Cold War, the World War, but you don't hear how um, the U.S. has actually contributed to having the most bombs in Laos. So that is a component in our history that is often forgotten, but while traveling abroad, you hear about these different perspectives from people and communities. We also visited Thailand where we learned about environmental justice um, and got to interact with elephants there. We also traveled to Cambodia. That was the last leg of our trip where we learned about the genocide over there that happened in the 70s, which wasn't too long ago, but people often forget about it or don't know about it. And that trip is also $3,000, but thankfully the transportation cost is included in that fee because I know for sure that I think I traveled at least 10 flights while being over there and that could have been well over $3,000, but thankfully JAO does keep the cost very low and that program fee did cover our flights. And as for spring break, we have an alternative spring break Hawaii component. Um, that's one week and the flight is not included in the $1,200 cost, but students usually have like a three month um, span to gauge prices. And a lot of the times our students um, fly together. So if you've never flown before, it does take that stress off your, your shoulders. And while there we learn about um, US imperialism as well and colonization. Um, we learned about, I'm sorry, how many? the con uh, Native people's connection to land. And it's not necessarily a tourist um, perspective that we go. We definitely give back to our community and value our service learning there. And for summer, we're working on our pilot trip to Alaska. In the past, we've also had a Vivir Mexico where students learned about um, service learning over there and definitely gave back to the community over a span of a month and definitely got to debunk these myths that are from the media where they portray Mexico a certain way. So students got to interact on their own and build their own um, value towards the country in Mexico because they definitely traveled to multiple places in Mexico as well. And I like to mention that with Hawaii and our Alaska programs, programs, it does allow for DACA and undocumented students to travel. We definitely wanna to expand to different backgrounds to students and not limit them so they can also participate. And then we offer our symposium, as Elena mentioned, that way students, after all these programs, we can reflect on our experiences and share with other students to get more participation. But definitely I like to point out that our cost is kept very low. And I do value that our transportation is often included in our programs because that can definitely be a barrier for students to travel. But with Jao, we, we let our students know that it is possible to travel and that you're with a big group. So it alleviates the stress. So of course, with all of our programs, um, we do assessment of how successful it is, what the impact is, and, and if the students enjoyed it and what we can do better. Um, so from our assessment, we found um, these five little um, results from there and what you gain as a student when you go on these one of these experiences. So you, um, the students gain an increase of knowledge, competency, and appreciation for culture, history, and people. You're really, you're not just going into a classroom and taking class for like three hours and going out, but you're really interacting with the community and the projects that you're working on. So you're always um, formally and informally um, working and learning at the same time for all these uh, uh, projects that we're doing. The commitment to environmental and social justice through access service learning one of the pillars of gel is doing service learning so like i said we try to do it so it's mutually beneficial for all parties um, involved so we're not only benefiting as students at the university of arizona but the other party is um, benefiting as well um, for example we work with some of the students at the phnom penh micro campus um, in the semester beforehand even going there so we interact with those students and work together to produce something that's mutually beneficial for both parties 
Um, acquiring travel and navigational skills with um, diverse settings. A lot of the students that participate in our program have not been on a plane before, have not been out of Arizona before, just because um, they didn't get the opportunity for for one reason or another. Um, we try to teach those soft skills for students, especially, for example, if you had an interview across the um, across the US and you never traveled before. It's very hard to pick up those skill sets to go um, and you might forget some one thing or another. We, we all, we're open to all questions that, um, um, that associate with travel and we go from the beginning. How do you get your ticket? What things to pack? Things like that. So that's just one of the soft skills that we teach um, so you can uh, be, be more comfortable in travel and navigation skills. Personal identity development and self-awareness. You mature really quickly in one of these programs and you develop critical thinking skills. And like the programs um, that we've talked about before, they're maybe a month long, but in that period of time, um, we always teach uh, to be comfortable in the uncomfortable because you're always gonna see an uncomfortable situation. And the more, um, the better you react to that, the more successful you're gonna be in life. If you see an uncomfortable situation and you freeze, you're not gonna move forward. Um, but if you sit back and say, why am I uncomfortable and how do I move forward? You're gonna be more successful in life. And that's where that self-awareness piece comes in and, and how you can develop and mature um, faster. Um, and then commitment to the U of A career path and graduation. Um, we know there's different learning styles that students have and you might not agree upon all the different learning styles that are at the U of A and experiential learning might be um, the way you learn best. And then we see that. A lot of students that uh, have gone on these experiences have thought about dropping out or stopping, uh, stopping out. But because they're reinvigorated by the work that we do in these programs, um, they've made a plan or been allowed to change their um, majors and be more successful at the university. Um, and going back to what uh, Elena was saying about uh, career development, a lot of these students learn how to transfer um, their skill sets that they learn from these experiences to their career path, to their academic path to be more successful. And then in this uh, past three years of existence, I really call it two and a half years because of the pandemic, we have grown significantly. Um, for all the, um, the years that we've been here, we've been fully funded by the student services fee. So it's student voted upon and student um, wanted and recommended um, that we go on because it's benefiting the students in a different way and a successful way. From the beginning, we went from two programs all the way to 17 programs. You saw that um, with Aries in her presentation of her slide. We had about We've had about 453 participants in those two and a half years. And in this past year, we've had 94% of those students identify as students of color and 72% have identified as first generation students. This past year too, um, we were successful in acquiring from the Thrive Center, $32,000 in scholarships for students. So that was an extreme help um, of getting students there and learning more about this program. And then we partner with other departments on campus and we're getting more partnerships as we go along. Some of the partnerships have been the College of Education and Mexican American Studies. Um, and like I said, more departments are coming forward and wanting to um, collaborate with us to get you those credits to um, uh, further your education. And then uh, student success and retention and, and innovation, uh, that department, we've had a collaboration with them. We're blessed to uh, have a videographer with us on our last trip to Southeast Asia, as well as having um, research um, partners with us to help us do this research. So in this next uh, slide, we're going to show you a little video of our Southeast Asia program that just happened right before the pandemic happened. <laughs> uh, so you can see what we actually go through on these experiences. I knew I was in for a huge shock coming here. I'm in that scene that I'm reading about. I have to figure how I'm going to navigate that rather than reading somebody else's experience. Education in that sense, it's a lot more meaningful to me when you are able to put someone in an environment where they're able to see things, taste things, smell things. Those are memories that stick with you on all levels. It's a holistic experience. It's a holistic learning experience. I feel like study abroad trips should be more like this. We're not just being tourists, we're actually being part of the community. I really appreciate Jell for giving this opportunity to us. 
We were in Ho Chi Minh City, which is a very, very large city, bustling and busy. How do they not look a lot of these students at this age don't even know about the Vietnam War. It didn't only affect Vietnam, but all the countries in Southeast Asia. Going to the War Remnants Museum in Vietnam, you really saw how it affected not just the soldiers, but the people too. They had a large series of tunnels. I left that with an appreciation of what U.S. soldiers went through, as well as what the Viet Cong soldiers had gone through. You actually get to see what happened. It's a lot of critical thinking. How do I view social justice? How do I view environmental rights? And Chiang Mai seems a lot more laid back. I'm a big fan of Asian cuisine, especially Southeast Asian, and I love spicy food. We got to go to a beautiful hike in a rainforest. We ended in a local village. We got to spend some time there with the locals, seeing them handcraft textiles and scarves. I remember a time when I had to make things to help out my family as well and help out my mom. There's definitely that core sense of working hard and doing things for your family. It's been phenomenal. Watching the growth, watching the developments of our students, to see them experience in depth what the culture is. This is something that most people are never gonna experience. Very gentle, gentle, majestic animals. A lot of the elephants had scars on them. You could see the definite change in their lifestyle when they came to Elephant Sanctuary. No longer malnourished, they were getting a lot of care and attention, and it was really nice to see them in that environment. I have to like stop myself and remind myself to take a deep breath and just like absorb where I'm at because the next thing you know I'm like blinking and I'm somewhere new. We were in Luang Prabang, which is not the capital of Laos, but it's one of the larger cities. It was a very mountainous, very beautiful, very clean city. We went to a village in the mountains, a very remote village with only about 400 people living there. We provided school supplies to the local elementary school there. We woke up bright and early at 5 a.m. to go participate in the almsgiving for the Buddhist monks. They do their meditation and then they go and collect food for the monasteries. These students are essentially ambassadors. They are leaders. We painted a elementary school in Laos. They were playing hand games. I taught them some in Spanish and some in English. It's reminding me of my roots and where I'm from. That really reminds me of Mexico and how I was brought up. The village elders gathered and participated in a traditional Lao ceremony, blessing us for safe travels and for good fortune in the future because of the help we did for their community. They taught us some of their dances and then we taught them some of our dances. And ours were a little faster. <laughs> we visited the American University of Phnom Penh. There's a U of A micro campus here. We got to interact with the local students. We visited the sites where the Khmer Rouge carried out their genocide against the Cambodian people where they killed about two million of their own people. He really came face to face with how evil a human being can be. It was a very, very chilling experience. We're really evaluating what we're seeing and connecting it to our lives. We also think about what are we bringing back to campus, back to our homes after this trip. They really dedicate hours creating this itinerary, creating this experience for students. We're seeing three to four times the applicants that can actually go on these experiences. Definitely more support is needed for these programs. There's so much that I admire about Southeast Asia, humility, their resilience. I see people with little resources able to create and do so much with what they have. And it makes me think that we can be doing those things back home too. We all have different stories and our stories are us. So that's a little 
kind of showcasing of what we do in our programs. Um, we try to keep the pillars of social justice, environmental justice, cultural exploration, and, and service learning within um, all of our programs, whether it be a one-day program or you know a month-long program. That was the one in winter that we go to Southeast Asia. We went to actually five different countries, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. And then we stopped in South Korea for a day um, because we had a, lay a long layover there and we learned a little bit more about the um, Korean uh, culture that's down there. So we hope you all can join us in the future in, in one of those experiences like that. Um, this year is a little bit different, obviously, with the pandemic um, and no traveling um, with the policies of not only the U of A, but also nationwide. Um, so we're we're evolving as we go along and hopefully we can provide this amazing experiences experience in this in this fall uh, 2020. We're converting everything into our phase one, which is everything virtually. Um, we partner with the Center for Digital Humanities to create these awesome interactive sessions. This one isn't so much just because we're getting out the information of what you need of how this all looks, um, but the next few will be amazing and we're doing this every month. Um, till the end of the semester. So we'll divide it up and you probably all probably got this flyer as well. Um, we're doing a cultural series um, and we'll explain this a little bit more in the next slides. Uh, Cats in the Community, which is our community service one, and then our global conversation series, which is our international one. the next slide please so crystal maybe you can go ahead with the um, cultural series we're having a little technical difficulties here So a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a little bit our, about our culture series, as Zan mentioned, um, is kind of focusing on the culture <clears throat> aspect of Tucson. Um, and I do have a team with Elena and Vanessa, um, and you can go ahead and mention as much as you want. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Vanessa talk a little bit about our programs that are coming up. All right, so in our culture series, uh, y'all will be learning about some cultural landmarks in Tucson. So more specifically in famous murals in different parts of Tucson. If you're from here, you've definitely seen some really, really nice um, murals, um, especially in South Tucson. Um, so we will have like muralists who created um, that piece right there, the Black Lives Matter piece that's downtown. Uh, thank you, Yemi. Um, her name is Camila on Canvas on Instagram. If y'all wanna give her a little follow and see the rest of her art. It's definitely something worthwhile to look at. Um, and we will also have a speaker from an art center called Las Artes. Uh, they're also from South Tucson. Um, and they specialize in helping young adults get, the, get their GED through art, which I think is amazing. Um, so yeah, if you can join us next month on the 28th um, from noon to one to learn more, definitely come. It's gonna be really educational and fun at the same time. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> so with cats in the community, we see that a lot of times uh, students who go to the U of A, they often are stuck within this bubble, right? They kind of forget that they're living in the city of Tucson. And so the city of Tucson has a beautiful culture. Um, we are only 45 minutes away from the border. We have um, an amazing, you know, culture that lives here as well as like different things that are going on within our city. And so with cats in the community, we want to make sure that we're highlighting that and we want to make sure that we're reaching out to different organizations and different efforts that are going on within the Tucson community and overall just highlighting that um, tomorrow actually tomorrow at 12 yes at 12 we will be having our first webinar with flowers and bullets um, they're a collective here in Tucson that focus on um, cultural tradition the Latinx culture tradition as well as 
cultural resilience and uh, tying that in with agriculture, music, and the arts, um, the arts being specifically uh, murals. So we want to make sure that we are exposing the you all as students, um, that there is a, you know, a city within the little city of um, U of A. So um, we really would love to have y'all come by and see tomorrow's uh, presentation. It's going to be seen and we get to kind of see and understand and uh, how, you know, y'all as students can go into the Tucson community and help with various efforts such as, you know, volunteering um, with local initiatives that are trying to better Tucson as a whole. So as mentioned before, um, with everything going around with COVID this semester, unfortunately, we are to go virtual, but we are still traveling like I said, virtually around the world to highlight contemporary topics with international students, faculty, staff, and partners. Um, every session that we will hold this fall, we will give every student a glimpse of multiple global perspectives and uh, the selected presenters that come into these sessions will give in a depth into a social justice issue that is being held within their community and they will talk more of how they're holding up with this issue. So on Wednesday from 10 to 11.30, we're having our social justice and human rights component with Lionel Davis. He's our guest speaker. He is actually an ex-former prisoner um, with Nelson Mandela. So that's going to be a great component to start off. If you guys are interested, we are going to have our links on our website so you could um, RSVP for that. And then um, we have our future component solidified. So we're having our Mexico border issues next month, October 29th. And we have Nadia Alvarez. She's a U of A director, she's going to um, have DACA students share their experiences um, with the whole pandemic. Um, and then we're gonna have our indigenous community in Hawaii component on November 19th with our friend Pia Kea from Hawaii. She's going to explain a lot of the US colonization in Hawaii, tourist impact in Hawaii. Um, and then we're gonna have our final component, at least for the semester with LGBTQ plus global with um, Adriana Arroyo from the UA. He's also a director and he's going to speak on global issues with the LGBTQ community. So as Aries and other team members alluded to, we have a lot of really fun things planned for this semester, a lot of exciting events coming up. So in case you didn't, weren't able to write all that down, um, I wanted to provide you guys with our Instagram um, account. So you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So feel free to connect with us there. Um, we'll be posting periodically throughout the semester of upcoming events. It's also an opportunity if you wanna contact us with questions, those are all modalities that you can use. Um, I also want to direct you to our website. So again, a lot of the information that we cover today can be found on our website. And even more importantly, um, all of the Zoom links to our virtual series events can be found on our website. So as you mark the dates down in your calendar, definitely refer to our website the day of so that you can get connected on there and um, attend some of these exciting events we have planned for you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so that was kind of like the end of our presentation. We do have, we did cover a lot. So um, we are going to open the floor for any questions. We do have one question and we'll go ahead and ask it now. Um, give me a second. This is from Katrina Lee. Will these past programs be repeated? As far as we know, yes, a lot of these programs will be re repeated. It's all, um, it's all on contingency if we are allowed to travel again. Um, our phased out plan will be phase one, everything virtual, phase two, going domestically um, for our domestic experiences and phase three, rolling out our international experiences again. Um, so it's all contingent to the policies and if we can all mask up and, and stay um, healthy and within the restrictions of the COVID guidelines and we can get back to resume to getting back to somewhat normal again. Thank you, Dan. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and um, use the Q&A chat box and you can just like type a question and let us know.
I'm sure everybody's just kind of soaking this in. Um, so we will, this is a recording that we'll put on our website again. So if you have colleagues, friends, peers that want to learn more about gel, um, this will be presented there on a recording. Um, plus, like I said, this was the more informational one that we're um, showcasing for the rest of the semester. Like I said, we're going to have different uh, aspects of culture, community service, and international pieces out here. That's going to be pretty interesting. And with the collaboration with the Digital uh, Center for Digital Humanities, they're going to be more interactive so you can actually travel with us um, virtually while we're going on those experiences. So I just want to thank you all so much um, for sitting with us and learning more about gel. We hope to see you in the next few days. Um, our next one will be at noon tomorrow with uh, Flowers and Bullets, our community service um, piece, Cats in the Community piece, as well as our international piece that's coming up this Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, so that's a different time. And that's with uh, Lionel Davis, who is going to talk about his political activism in South Africa. Um, and hopefully that is one of the experiences we're going to add on to um, our gel kind of repertoire of, of different experiences. Uh, so South Africa is on that list as well. So thank you so much. And if you have any other questions, you can either email um, on our website or email me personally, um, and we'll get back to you. So thank you so much.